to a place called Calvary or the skull, Luke says in verse 26, they just grabbed a bystander, a man by the name of Simon of Serene, and they compelled him to bear the cross of Jesus up the Via Della Rosa to a place called Calvary. Yeah. I just thought about to tell you that if you will avail yourself to Jesus, uh -huh. that he can use bystanders. He can use bystanders to fulfill his work and his ministry. Yeah. It doesn't require a PhD, or MBA, or DDS. It only requires an available soul who's willing to surrender themselves totally to the ministry of the Lord. And so we see in this text, an obscure fellow by the name of Simon of Cyrene is recorded in the holy record as the one who helped Jesus by bearing his cross up the mountain to Calvary. Oh, there's a cross for you, and there's a cross for me. When this ministry of the Lord, in this great movement that we know as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, in this throng of those who've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, there's difficulty and there's hardship when we identify ourselves with Christ. And there are often crosses that we have to bear to serve him. The crosses that we will bear of loneliness and despair, of disappointment and broken hearts because we identify with him, because we associate with this lowly Nazarene. Amen. So Simon of Cyrene, a bystander, was compelled to bear the cross of Jesus. There were two others who did not volunteer to be identified with Jesus. Verse 32, two others also who were criminals were being led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them. And then they cast lots, or they threw dice, is what we would do, for his clothing. And the Bible says, that the rulers were sneering at him and jeering at him and mocking him, saying, save yourself if you're the Christ, the Son of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. But there was also an inscription above him, this is the king of the Jews. And then the text says in 39, it says, one of the criminals. Now, you have to read Mark and Luke's account of this same record. Because in Mark and Luke's account of this same record, Mark and Luke, or Mark and Matthew, I should say, Mark and Matthew says that both of the thieves were mocking him, were railing him. Both of them. But somewhere with this one thief, somewhere through his slurs and somewhere through his insults toward Jesus, he was arrested. That the Spirit of the living God arrested him there on that cross. And he came to himself. And he began to realize that this Jesus, this Nazarene, was dying differently from the way they were dying. They were fighting and they were resisting it. And they were trying to hold on to the life. But Jesus was not struggling and he was not fighting because men were not taking his life. The Bible says he was freely laying his life down. He was offering himself up as the Lamb of God, as the sin bearer. And there on that cross, he was being punished as a sinner, even though he knew no sin. And the sins of you and the sins of me were being placed upon him. And he was there as a dumb lamb, as a dumb sheep there he was before his executioners. So he wasn't fighting or resisting in some way this repentant thief realized that if a man can die like this, if he dies like this, there's something different about him. So somewhere between a slur and an insult, conviction was aroused in his heart. 
And so he says in 39 of 23, one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, do you not even fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation and we indeed are suffering justly for we're receiving what we deserve for our deed. Oh, that's rich with meaning. That's pregnant with significance. This thief there hanging on the cross, being crucified as a thief, as a kleptomaniac, and apparently he became very good at it. He must have been a professional because they would not have crucified him for one act of thievery. But apparently he had mastered the art and the trade, and he was passing off stolen goods. And now he had been tried and convicted as a capital criminal and was being crucified. And there on the cross, he realized that his punishment was justly deserved. Oh, my beloved, in this society in which we live, where many see themselves as victims of circumstances, and everyone is quick to pass the buck and to excuse their own indiscretions and to explain away their own transgressions and compare themselves with someone else and conclude, I'm not that bad. But how refreshing it is to see a man being executed for his sins and says, I justly deserve this. My punishment is fair and just. I knew that if I committed the crime, that there were consequences associated with it. So conviction reigned there in his heart. You know the reason many people never come to Christ is because they never are willing to acknowledge guilt. They're never willing to acknowledge shame. The Bible says that we have all sinned and we all come short of the glory of God. And there's none righteous, no, not even you, not even me. Amen. That we've all transgressed, we've all broken the law, we've all trespassed. And we must come to that realization that regardless of how bad someone else is, that when we stand before Jesus Christ, we don't stand in the group. We stand a single file. Amen. And we give account to him for our life, for our sins, for our deeds. And in this life, God moves in our hearts and he gives us a conscience. And that conscience is pricked by the truth. The truth that we have transgressed, we've broken God's law, we have done wrong. And we have one or two choices to admit it and to fall down before God and cry, Lord have mercy on me, or oh, sinner. Or we can be like those fish who are in the New River where I used to fish when I was a kid. And we had this big net, and we would cast out this big net out into the waters. And he had weights on the end of it. And the net would, the weights would then pull the net down into the water. And then we would drag in the net. And very often we would catch fish in the net. And as we were pulling the fish in, the net would touch them. And the fish would then dart to what they thought was newfound liberty. And they thought they were free. But we would continue to pull that net toward the shore. And every time the net would touch the fish, they would dart away thinking that they were free. But finally the net would reach the shore and there was nowhere to run and there was nowhere to escape. That's the way God's justice is. That's the way God's kingdom moves. God has cast out the net and God is pulling the net towards shore. And the net is touching the lives of people and people are sensing a need to come clean and to get right with God and receive Christ as Savior. They come to the church, they hear songs sung, they're moved and they're stirred emotionally. They hear testimonies offered, the word of God preached and they sense this need to get right with God. But instead of acting on that, they tarry and they pause and they say, perhaps next week, perhaps next time. And they dart away like those fish who are in the perimeter of that net, not realizing that that's one more lost opportunity. And that net is moving toward justice and toward judgment. This dying thief on this cross, when he was touched by the justice of God, when he was touched by the mercy and the grace of God on that cross, he was arrested and he realized 
that he was a sinner and he needed to be saved. And so he says to his friend, his pardon in crime, we're getting what we deserve. 